Hey, today I'll continue reading Pride and Prejudice, starting with Volume 2, um, Chapter 15. Chapter 15 On Saturday morning, Elizabeth and Mr. Collins met for breakfast a few minutes before the others appeared, and he took the opportunity of paying the parting civilities which he deemed indispensably necessary. I know not, Miss Elizabeth, said he, whether Mrs. Collins has yet expressed her sense of your kindness in coming to us, but I am very certain you will not leave the house without receiving her thanks for it. The favor of your company has been much felt, I assure you. We now we know how little there is to tempt any one to our humble abode. Our plain manner, manner of living, our small rooms, and few domestics, and the little we see of the world, must make Hunsford extremely dull to a young lady like yourself. But I hope you will believe us grateful for the condescension, and that we have done everything in our power to prevent your spending spending your time unpleasantly. Elizabeth was eager with her thanks and assurances of happiness. She had spent six weeks with great enjoyment, and the pleasure of being with Charlotte and the kind attentions she had received must make her feel the obliged. Mr. Collins was gratified, and with a more smiling solemnity replied, It gives me the greatest pleasure to hear that you have passed your time not disagreeably. We have certainly done our best, and most fortunately having it in our power to introduce you to very superior society, and from our connection with Rosings, the frequent means of varying the humble home scene, I think we may flatter ourselves that your Hunsford visit cannot have been entirely irksome. Our situation with regard to Lady Catherine's family is indeed the sort of extraordinary advantage and blessing which few can boast. You can see, you see on what a footing we are. You see how continually we are engaged there. In truth, I must acknowledge that, with all, the advantage, with all the disadvantages of this humble parsonage, I should not think anyone abiding in it an object of compassion while they are sharers of our intimacy at Rosings. Words were insufficient for the elevation of his feelings, and he was obliged to walk about the room while Elizabeth tried to unite civility and truth in a few short, short sentences. You may, in fact, carry a very favorable report of us into Hertfordshire, my dear cousin, I flatter myself at least that you will be able to do so. Lady Catherine's great attentions to Mrs. Collins you have been a daily witness of, and altogether I trust it does not appear that your friend has drawn an unfortunate, but on this point it will be it, is, it will be as well to be silent. Only let me assure you, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that I can from my heart most cordially wish you equal felicity in marriage. My dear Charlotte and I have but one mind and one way of thinking. There is in everything a most remarkable resemblance of character and ideas between us. We seem to have been designed for each other. Elizabeth could safely say that it was a great happiness where that was the case, and with equal sincerity could add she firmly believed and rejoiced in his domestic comforts. She was not sorry, however, to have the recital of them interrupted by the entrance of the lady from whom they sprung. Poor Charlotte! It was melancholy to leave her to such society. But she had chosen it with her eyes open, and though evidently regretting that her visitors were to go, she did not seem to ask for compassion. Her home and her housekeeping, her parish and her poultry, and all their dependent concerns had not yet lost their charms. At length the chase arrived, the trunks were fashioned on, fastened on, the parcels placed within, and it was pronounced to be ready. After an affectionate parting between the friends, Elizabeth was attended to the carriage by Mr. Collins, and as they walked down the down the garden, he was not he was commissioning her with his best respects to all her family, not forgetting his thanks for the kindness he had received at Longbourn in the winter, and his compliments to Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner, though unknown. He then handed her in, Maria followed, and the door was on the point of being closed when he suddenly reminded them, with some consternation, that they, are, they had hitherto forgotten to leave any message for the later ladies of Rosings. But, he added, you will, of course, wish to have your humble respects delivered of them, delivered to them with your grateful thanks for their kindness to you while you have been here. Elizabeth made no objection. The door was then allowed to be shut, and the carriage drove off. Good gracious, cried Maria, after a few minutes' silence. It seems but a day or two since we first came, and yet how many things have happened? A great many indeed, said her companion with a sigh. We have dined twi nine times at Rosings, besides drinking tea there twice. How much I shall have to tell. Elizabeth privately added, and how much I shall have to conceal. Their journey was performed without much conversation or any alarm, and within four hours of their leaving Hunsford, they reached Mr. Gardiner's house, 
where they were to remain a few days. Jane looked well, and Elizabeth had little opportunity of studying her spirits amidst the various engagements with the kind which the kindness of her aunt had reserved for them. But Jane was to go home with her, and at Longbourn there would be leisure enough for observation. It was not without an effort, meanwhile, that she could wait even for Longbourn, Longbourn for, before she told her sister of Mr. Darcy's proposals. To know that she had the power of revealing what would so exceedingly astonish Jane, and must, at the same time, so highly gratify whatever of her own vanity she had not yet been able to reason away, there was such a temptation to openness as nothing could have conquered, but the state of indecision in which she remained, as to the extent of what she should communicate, and her fear, if she once entered on the subject, of being hurried into repeating something of Bingley, which might only grieve her sister farther. Chapter 16 It was the second week in May, in which the three young ladies set out together from Grace Church Street for the town of in Hertfordshire, in Hertfordshire and as they, as they grew, drew near the appointed inn where Mr. Bennet's carriage was to meet them, they, all, they quickly perceived, in token of the coachman's punctuality, both Kitty and Lydia looking out of a dining room upstairs. These two girls had been above an hour in the place, happily employed in visiting an opposite milliner, watching the sentinel on guard, and dressing a salad and cucumber. After welcoming their sisters, they triumphantly displayed a table set out with such cold meat as an inn larder usually affords, exclaiming, Is this not nice? Is this not an agreeable surprise? And we mean to treat you all, added Lydia, but you must lend us the money, for we have just spent ours at the shop out there. Then showing her purchases. Look here, I have bought this bonnet. I do not think it is very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as, as not. I shall put it to pieces as soon as I get home and see if I can make it up any better. And when her sisters abused it as ugly, she added with perfect unconcern, Oh, but there were two or three much uglier in the shop, and when I have bought some prettier colored satin to trim it with fresh, I think it will be very tolerable. Besides, it will not much signify what, what one wears this summer, after the Shire have let, left Meryton, and they are going in a fortnight. Are they indeed? cried Elizabeth with the greatest satisfaction. They are going to be encamped near Brighton, and I do so want Papa to take us all there for the summer. It would be such a delicious scheme and I dare say it would cost hardly anything at all. Mama would like to go, too, of all things. Only think of what a miserable summer else we shall have. Yes, thought Elizabeth, that would be a delightful scheme, indeed, and completely do for us at once. Good heaven, Brighton, and a whole camp full of soldiers to us, who have been overset already by one poor regiment of militia and the monthly balls in Meryton. Now I've got some news for you, said, said Lydia, as they sat down to table. What do you think? It's excellent news, capital news, and about a certain person that we all like. Jane and Elizabeth looked at each other, and the waiter was told that he need not stay. Lydia laughed and said, Aye, that is just like your formality and discretion. You thought the waiter must not hear, as if he cared. I dare, dare, say, he ought, I dare say he often hears worse things than what I was going to say. But he is an ugly fellow. I am glad he is gone. I never saw such a long chin in my life. Well, but now for my news. It is about dear Wickham. Too good for the waiter, is it not? There is no danger of Wickham's marrying Mary King. There is for you. She's gone down to her uncle at, at Liverpool, gone to stay. Wickham is safe. And Mary King is safe, added Elizabeth, safe from a connection imprudent as to fortune. She is a great fool for going away, if she liked him. But I hope there is no strong attachment on either side, said Jane. I am sure there is not on his. I will answer for it he never cared three straws about her. Who could about such a nasty little freckled thing? Elizabeth was shocked to think that, however incapable of such coarseness and of expression herself, the coarseness of sentiment was of the sentiment was little other than her own breast had formerly harbored and fancied liberal. As soon as all had ate, the elder ones paid, the, ca the carriage was ordered, and after some contrivance, the whole party, with all their boxes, work bags, and parcels, and the unwelcome addition of Kitty's and Lydia's purchases were seated in it. "'How nicely we are crammed in!' cried Lydia. "'I am glad I bought my bonnet, if it is only for the fun of having another bandbox. "'Well, now let us be quite comfortable and snug, and talk and laugh all the way home. "'And in the first place, let us hear what has happened to you all since you went away. "'Have you seen any pleasant men? Have you had any flirting? 
I was in great hopes that one of you would have got a husband before you came back. Jane will be quite an old maid soon, maid soon I declare. She's almost three and twenty. Lord, how ashamed I should be of not being married before three and twenty. My Aunt Phillips wants you, wants you so to get husbands. You can't think. She says Lizzie had better have taken Mr. Collins, but I do not think there would have been any fun in it. Lord, how I should like to be married before any of you, and then I would chaperone you about to all the balls. Dear me, we had such a good piece of fun the other day at Colonel Forster's. Kitty and me were to spend the day there, and Mrs. Forrester promised to have a little dance in the evening. By the by, Mrs. Forrester and me are such friends. And so she asked the two Harringtons to come, but Harriet was ill, and so Penn was forced to come by herself. And then what do you think we did? We dressed up Chamberlain in women's clothes, on purpose to pass for a lady. Only think what fun. Not a soul knew of it, but Colonel and Mrs. Foster, eh, Forrester, and Kitty and me, except my aunt, we were forced to borrow when one of her gowns, and you cannot imagine how well he looked. When Denny and Wickham and Pratt and two or three of three more of the men came in, they did not know him in the least. Lord, how I laughed, and so did Mrs. Forrester. I thought I should have died, and that made the men sum suspect something, and then they soon found out what was the matter. With such kind of histories of their parties and good jokes, did Lydia, assisted by Kitty's hints, and additions, endeavor to amuse her companions all the way to Longbourn. Elizabeth listened as little as she could, but there was no escaping the frequent mention of Wickham's name. Their reception at home was most kind. Mrs. Bennet rejoiced to see Jane in undiminished beauty, and more than once during dinner did Mr. Bennet say voluntarily to Elizabeth, I am glad you are come back, Lizzie. Their party in the dining room was large, for almost all the Lucases came to meet Maria and hear the news and various were the subjects which occupied them. Lady Lucas was inquiring of Maria across the table, after the welfare and poultry of her eldest daughter. Mrs. Bennet was doubly engaged, on one hand collecting an account of the present fashions from Jane, who sat some way below her, and on the other retail retailing them to all the younger Mrs. Lucases. And Lydia, in, the, in a voice rather louder than any other person's, was enumerating the various pleasures of the morning to anybody who would hear her. Oh, Mary, said she, I wish you had gone with us, for we had such fun. As we went along, Kitty and me drew up all the blinds and pretended there was nobody in the coach, and I should have gone all and I should have gone so all the way if Kitty had not been sick, and when we got to the gorge, I do think we behaved very handsomely, for we treated the other three with the nicest cold luncheon in the world, and if you would have gone, we would have treated you too. And then when we came away came away, it was such fun. I thought we should we never should have gone into the coach. I was ready to die of laughter, and then we were so merry all the way home. We talked and laughed so loud that anybody might have heard us ten miles off. To this, Mary gra very gravely replied, Far be it from me, my dear sister, to depreciate such pleasures. The word doubtless may be congenial with the generality of female minds, but I confess that they would have no charms for me. I should infinitely prefer a book. But of this answer, Lydia heard not a word. She seldom listened to anybody more than half a minute, and never attended to Mary at all. In the afternoon, Lydia was urgent with the rest of the girls to walk to Maryton and see how everybody went on, but Elizabeth steady, steadily opposed the scheme. It should not be said that the Miss Bennets could not be home at, at home a day, half a day before they were in, the, in pursuit of the officers. There was another reason, too, for her opposition. She dreaded seeing Wickham again, and was resolved to avoid it as long as possible. The comfort to her of the regiment's approaching removal was indeed beyond expression. In a fortnight they were ready to go, and once gone, she hoped there could be nothing more to plague her on his account. She had not been many hours at home before she found that the Brighton scheme, of which Lydia had given them a hint at the end, was under frequent discussion between her parents. Elizabeth saw directly that her father had not the smallest intention of yielding, but his answers were at the same time so vague and equivocal that her mother, though often disheartened, had never yet despaired of succeeding at last. Chapter 17 Elizabeth's impatient to acquaint Jane with what had happened could no longer be overcome, and at length resolving to suppress every particular in which her sister was concerned, and preparing her to be surprised, she related to her the, the next morning the chief of the scene between Mr. Darcy and herself. 
Miss Bennet's astonishment was soon lessened by the strong sisterly partiality which made any admiration of Elizabeth appear perfectly natural, and all surprise was shortly lost in other feelings. She was sorry that Mr. Mr. Darcy should have delivered his sentiments in a manner so little suited to recommend them, but still more was she grieved for the unhappiness which her sister's refusal must have given him. His being so sure of succeeding was wrong, said she, and certainly ought not to have appeared, but consider how much it must increase his disappointment. Indeed, replied Elizabeth, I am heartily sorry for him, but he has other feelings which will probably soon drive away his regard for me. You do not blame me, however, for refusing him? Blame you? Oh, no. But you blame me for having, having spoken so warmly of Wickham. No, I do not know you were wrong in, in saying anything you did. But you will know it when I have told you what happened the very next day. She then spoke of the letter, repeating the whole of its contents as far as they concerned George Wickham. What a stroke this was for poor Jane, who would willingly have gone through the world without believing that so much wickedness existed in the whole race of mankind, as was here collected in one individual. Nor was Darcy's vindication, though grateful to her feelings, capable of consoling her for such discovery. Most earnestly did she, did she labor to prove the probability of error, and seek to clear one without involving the other. This will not do, said Elizabeth. You never will be able to make both of them good for anything. Take your choice, but you must be satisfied with only one. There is but such a quantity of merit between them, just enough to make one good sort of man, and of late it has been shifting about pretty much. For my part, I am inclined to believe it all, Mr. Darcy's, but you shall do as you choose. It was some time, however, before a smile could be extorted from Jane. I do not know when I have been more shocked, said she. Wickham so very bad. It, almost is, it is almost past belief. And poor Mr. Darcy. Dear Lizzie, only consider what he must have suffered. Such a disappointment, and with the knowledge of your, Ill, of your ill opinion, too, and having to relate such a thing of his sister. It is really too distressing. I am sure you must feel it so. Oh, no, my regret and, and compassion are my regret and compassion are all done away by seeing you so full of both. I know you will do him such ample justice that I am growing every moment, moment more unconcerned and indifferent. Your profusion makes me saving, and if you lament over him much longer, my heart will be light as a feather. Poor Wickham, there is such an expression of goodness in his countenance, such an openness and gentleness in his manner. There was certainly some great mismanagement in the education of those two young men. One has got all the goodness, and the other all the appearance of it. I never thought Mr. Darcy so deficient in the appearance of it as you used to do. And yet I meant to be uncommonly clever in taking so decided a dislike to him without any reason. It is such a spur to one's genius, such an opening for wit to have a dislike of that kind. One may, continue, one may be continually abusive without saying anything just but one cannot be always laughing at a man without now and then stumbling on something witty. Lizzie, when you first read that letter, I'm sure you could not treat the matter as you do now. Indeed, I could not. I was comfortable enough. I was very uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable enough. I was very uncomfortable. I may say unhappy. And with no one to speak to of what I felt, no Jane to comfort me and say that I had not been so very weak and vain and nonsensical as I knew I had. Oh, how I wanted you. How unfortunate that you should have been, that you should have used such very strong expressions in speaking of Wickham to Mr. Darcy, for now they do appear wholly undeserved. Certainly, but the misfortune of speaking with bitterness is a most natural consequence of the prejudices which I had been encouraging. There is one point on which I want your advice. I want to be told whether I ought or ought not to make our acquaintance in general understand Wickham's character. Miss Bennet paused a little and then replied. Surely there can be no occasion for exposing him so dreadfully. What is your own opinion? That it ought not to be attempted. Mr. Darcy has not authorized me to make his communication public. On the contrary, every particular relative to his sister was meant to be kept as much as possible to myself, and if I endeavor to undeceive people as to the rest of his conduct, who will believe me? The general prejudice against Mr. Darcy is so violent that it would be the death of half the good people in Meryton to attempt to place him in an amiable light. I am not equal to it. Wickham will soon be gone, and therefore it will not signify to anybody here what he really is. 
Sometime hence, it will it'll be all found out, and then we may laugh at their stupidity and not knowing it before. At present, I will say nothing about it. You are quite right. To have his errors made public might ruin him forever. He is now perhaps sorry for what he has done and anxious to reestablish a character. We must not make him desperate. The tumult of Elizabeth's mind was allayed by this conversation. She had got rid of two of the secrets which had weighed her debt which had weighed on her for a fortnight, and was certain of, of a willing listener in Jane, whenever she might wish to talk again of either. But there is still something lurking behind, of which prudence forbade the disclosure. She dared not relate the other half of Mr. Darcy's letter, nor explain to her sister how sincerely she had been valued by his friend. Here was knowledge in which no one could partake, and she was sensible that nothing less than a perfect understanding between the parties could justify her in throwing off this last incumbent encumbrance of mystery. And then, said she, if that very improbable event should ever take place, I shall merely be able to tell what Bingley may tell in a more, in much more agreeable manner himself. The liberty of communication cannot be mine till it has lost all its value. She was now, on being settled at home, at leisure to observe the real state of her sister's spirits. Jane was not happy. She still cherished a very tender affection for Bingley. Having never been fancied herself in love before, or having never even fancied herself in love before, her regard had, had all the warmth of first attachment, and from her age and disposition, greater steadiness than first attachments often boast. And so fervently did she value his remembrance, and prefer him to every other man, that all her good sense and all, all her attentions to the feelings of her friends were requisite to check the indulgence of those regrets, which must have been injury, injurious to her own health and their tranquility. Well, Lizzie, said Mrs. Bennet one day, what is your opinion now of this sad business of Jane's? For my part, I am determined never to speak of it again to anybody. I told my sister Phillips so the other day, but I cannot find out that Jane saw anything of him in London. Well, he is a very undeserving young man, and I do not suppose there is the least chance in the world of her ever getting him now. There is no talk of his coming to another field again in the summer, and I have inquired of everybody, too, who is likely to know. I do not believe that he will ever live at Netherfield any more. Oh, well, it is just as he chooses. Nobody wants him to come, though I, shall say all, sh though I shall always say that he used my daughter extremely ill, and if I was her, I would not have put up with it. Well, my comfort is, I am sure Jane will die of a broken heart, and then he will be sorry for what he has done. But as Elizabeth could not receive comfort from any such expectation, she made no answer. Well, Lizzie, continued her mother soon afterwards, and so the Collinses live very comfortable, do they? Well, well, I only hope it will last. And what sort of table do they keep? Charlotte is an excellent manager, I dare say. If she is half as sharp as her mother, she is saving enough. There is nothing extravagant in their housekeeping, I dare say. No, nothing at all. A great deal of good management depend upon it. Yes, yes, they will take care not to outrun their income. They will never be distressed for money. Well, much good it may do them. And so, I suppose, they often talk of having Longbourn when your father is dead. They often they look upon it quite as their own, I dare say, whenever that happens. It is a subject which they could not mention before me. No, it would have been strange if they had. But I make no doubt, they often talk of it between themselves. Well, if they can be easy with an estate that is not lawfully their own, so much the better. I should be ashamed of having one that was only entailed on me. That's the end of chapter 17. Um, we will continue with chapter 18 in the next video.